You're listening to the We Are Libertarians podcast network. Find all of our shows at wearelibertarians.com. Welcome to the Chris Spangle Show. Thank you so much for joining me here on the program today. We're going to be talking about a... It's not a regulation. Um, it's it's one of those weird things where it's not a regulation, but it feels like it. Uh, with big banks are green lighting a plan to track gun pur- store purchases. Not guns, gun store purchases. You can buy coffee and it codes. So why is this a problem? Well, we're going to talk today with Cody... Cody wouldn't. I didn't even have problems with Winooski, Cody. Uh, <laughs> Cody Winooski, Wisniewski, excuse me, I did actually, who is a senior attorney for constitutional litigation with the Firearms Policy Coalition, one of my favorite follows on Instagram. His work has appeared in the Washington Times, the Washington Examiner, National Review, Daily Wire, and more. And he primarily focuses on Second Amendment issues, but is happy so long as he's reminding the government of its enumerated powers and constitutional limitations. My apologies on absolutely murdering both of your names. And thank you so much for being here, Cody. No worries, Chris. And thanks for having me. I'm happy to be here. So how did you fall into your line of work? What got you interested in gun policy? Well, there's a really long story behind it. But the short version is that uh, I originally grew up in California. I apologize in advance to all of your listeners. Um, And I went to law school in California. And watching, you know, my family wasn't um, really into guns when I was young. It wasn't common. We didn't have firearms around the house when I was a kid. My dad really got into it when I was older. And watching what my dad had to go through in California in order to be a gun owner while sitting in law school classes, especially sitting in like a constitutional law class and just seeing our system of government and trying to fully understand how lawyers looked at things like the right to keep and bear arms. And I saw this, this juxtaposition I saw, and I really found that gun rights and guns were kind of the, the microcosm of the macrocosm. If you could do things like you did to guns to a constitutionally protected right, then what was going to happen to speech? What was going to happen to privacy? What was going to happen to everything else down the list? And it really ignited this passion in me in order to ensure that people can accurately and effectively defend themselves and protect their lives, protect their loved ones and protect their communities. So you wrote an article in the Federalist about this new policy at some banks. And like I said, it's not a regulation. We normally are talking about regulations that we don't like, but this is one of those weird little areas where uh, banks are starting to do something. What are they starting to do? And what was your article about? Yeah, absolutely. So the they're right. This is kind of a, a little bit odd in how it how it comes about. So what you have is this uh, merchant credit card code, this merchant code that's applied to uh, merchants and stores around not just the United States, but around the world. And a lot of these are promulgated by an international body, the International Standardization Organization. And it's this idea that these international banks, Visa, MasterCard, which are obviously accepted around the world, along with banks that have processing around the world, buy into this this kind of uh, semi-voluntary standardization ability so that they can kind of speak with one another. Sounds fairly benign. Sounds like the sort of thing where you have a market actually resolving problems as opposed to government stepping in. Where the concern came here is that uh, some bank, Uh, lobbied the International Standardization Organization to create a code that will only apply to purchases made at gun stores in the United States. So what this looks like is anytime somebody makes a purchase at a gun store in the United States that has this merchant code, that purchase will be coded as a U.S. gun store purchase. As you kind of mentioned in the beginning, it it doesn't necessarily have to be a firearm or ammo. It could be coffee and a t-shirt because you can buy coffee at every gun store as we all know um it it applies to the purchase and what's concerning here isn't necessarily the existence of the code it's what people are saying that the code tells you the data that they claim that it's going to give you and where people should be cautious where i think your listeners should really be watching out is how is that information and data going to be potentially co-opted by governments in the future? 
So give us a little bit more about the code. I mean, it's what is this data then sold to like auction brokers? Is it used by governments? Do you know much about it? So it's brand new. So, but as we all know, that I, is, I mean, the coding system at large, oh, not absolutely. just the, this particular one. Yeah. So, I mean, that information is all available for sale at times through auction brokers, um, you know, depending on what limits government has placed upon itself. Sometimes that can be purchased and used by government. Sometimes it can't. And that's actually one big thing that, you know, we should dig into. And one big thing that the piece covers is, uh, you know, a way for people to, to respond to this is to, to, you know, stop government from being able to use this data inappropriately. Uh, but yeah, so as of right now, the way that this works is banks apply codes to every purchase. Every purchase that you make using a debit card or a, a credit card has some sort of code applied to it based on this standardization. Prior to this gun store code being put into place, gun stores were just marked as general merchandise. So there was no specific coding one way or another. It was just a general store purchase. But now... Anytime a debit or credit card with one of these, you know, affiliated entities that's going to be employing the code, anytime they're used to make any purchase at a coded gun store, that purchase, that, that code on your credit card statement, essentially, will be linked as a gun store purchase. And then that data will be kept uh, and can be used for any number of things in the future. Those that lobbied for the code claim that they're going to be able to use that code to target dangerous uh, gun purchases and dangerous purchasing trends. But first of all, they've failed to identify what a dangerous purchasing trend would be. I mean, there's nothing that bears out how people who use guns to commit crime purchase in a specific way. There's, there's no information. And, and by that, do they mean that if I make, you know, uh, four days in a row, a purchase at a gun store, Somehow I'm going to be flagged and, you know, maybe sent to the local authorities to trigger Indiana's red flag law. Like, is that the concern or is that their explicit intent? So that is that is the concern. Um, I don't know that they've specifically said that they're going to you know use that kind of of specific scenario or use these scenarios to then ship this off. But in their view, this is the first step to targeting and responding to those dangerous purchasing trends. And Chris, I think you're exactly on, right? I mean, they're going to look at things, the, the, what they're going to claim, and that's what's dangerous here, isn't what the data says. It's what they claim the data says. They're going to claim that people who are buying multiple days in a row, people who are making big purchases, people who are um, you know, repeatedly making big purchases, that those are potentially dangerous individuals, and then that's going to deserve more scrutiny from the government, right? They're going to force, or they're going to try to use that to say, these people need investigated. And that's where it's really, you know, potentially dangerous in the future, right? We know that these so-called red flag laws are just due process avoidance schemes. And not only are they uh, atrocious when it comes to a respect for constitutionally protected rights, but they also create a lot of danger when you've got these, uh, you know, friction visits between law enforcement and individuals who have really done nothing wrong. So, that's the problem, right? They're going to look at, or they're, they're saying that this data is going to tell them or going to indicate dangerous purchasing trends. So, you know, while they haven't explicitly said that that means law enforcement visits, what else would be the point? Why else would you want to collect that data just to, you well, know? The, based on the, the shows that we've done around ESG scores, that might give you a clue. They're wanting, wanting capital investment from BlackRock. <laughs> um, so the... Let's talk about red flag laws, um, because it seems like, uh, you know, if you're just somebody that watches the news and you watch these tragedies unfold and there seems to be a pattern amongst all these different tragedies, they're always known to law enforcement. They've always had some contact with local or national law enforcement. Um, and a lot of them have purchased weapons within the a short time frame like a lot uh, many of the guys that i i see in the news and the, the ones that get covered right that are politically useful um they they've purchased it recently you know in texas for instance the shooting several years ago there was a clerical error where his military record was not put on the background check system and he was able to buy guns and go and shoot up a church um th th why 
let me play devil's advocate because this is something that I, I see a lot of my Facebook friends struggling with when they're having a conversation around these issues. Why wouldn't you want more ability to track these things to stop one of these guys? I don't think that's, that's not the problem, right? That's, it's a, it's a problem that's set forth that isn't actually the issue. Um, a lot of places, first of all, red flag laws, the vast majority of them, everyone that I've looked into are atrocious when it comes to a due process perspective, right? They, the, the vast majority of these laws, if not all of them, allow for people to be disarmed without ever having made their own case, right? This, these orders are on an ex parte basis, meaning that the petitioner, the person who's asking for the red flag against somebody else, goes into court and makes their case for the, the protection order, the extreme risk protection order, without the respondent, the person being disarmed, ever knowing about the hearing, ever participating in the hearing, or ever having an attorney present. So they are, you know, just rife with abuse. I mean, Colorado passed red flag laws and some of the first ones were sought by a, a prisoner uh, trying to get a, a, a prison guard red flagged by claiming that they often shared a residence because the prison guard spent time in the prison, right? Oh, God. <laughs> you know, that's what happens with these. Also, the vast majority of places that are trying to enact red flag laws already have the ability to do mental health checks, mental health holds, and to potentially seize firearms if there's an actual mental health issue. So the tool already exists if they really want to try and flex that muscle or if they really want to try and use it. They're just not. They want this easy path through where they can avoid due process and take the guns and ask questions later, right? That's what, what these, these orders are. Moreover, you know, I would challenge the premise. I think the, the real consistent thing that we see when it comes to public shootings is far and away gun-free zones. These people intentionally target gun-free zones. I have had the misfortune of having to read, um, you know, a lot of the documents and a lot of the writings that these people put out before they or after they engage in, in these horrific events and uniformly uh, you know, when they discuss it, they specifically are targeting gun-free zones. You see that gun-free zones are more likely to experience a, a public shooting than places where there is a large amount of, of, of individual firearm ownership and individual firearm carry. So there's two answers right there, right? Look towards the actual mental health laws that are in place already that have due process protections in place and, and use those. And two, Stop leaving people defenseless, empower people to protect themselves and to protect their loved ones and to protect their communities. We know that when you have shootings in the place like the mall in, um, you know, I think that was in Indiana, where you have an armed civilian that's able to defend the community, they do so. That's bears out in the data. It bears out in the, the news. We can look at stories left, right and center where people are able to protect from shootings when they're when government gets out of the way. Yeah, I lived right by that mall for a very this podcast was started in an apartment 30 seconds from there. I'm very familiar with the story. It was a miraculous shot, to be honest, um, from a very well trained kid. And I give him props for not becoming famous <laughs> um, and just yeah. moving on with his life. Um, but Uvalde, I kind of as you were talking, my contrarian brain started to spark with Uvalde because that was not necessarily a gun free zone. And that you had um, several different campus police there. And then later you had a lot of armed people who just didn't do their jobs. And maybe that's just a freak accident. But he was another person who had gone and bought a gun fairly recently. Do you do you see any role or is there any solution that respects the Second Amendment that maybe you can articulate is a better way to ask it that can help prevent somebody who is clearly mentally disturbed from being sold a gun? Is it really just on these gun owners, uh, on the gun shop specifically, uh, to just be better citizens, to be better stewards? Or is that an unfair question in and of itself? I mean, there's a lot of information that's come out around Uvalde and, and st I think still trying to piece together, uh, you know, the public at large is still really trying to piece together what happened. One thing I would say is that Texas does have a prohibition on individuals carrying firearms on school grounds, whether it's followed by 
you know, everyday people or not, that is a law in Texas. Parents are supposed to or not allowed to carry their firearms um, onto school grounds when they're picking up and dropping off their kids, for example. And schools uniformly, uh, even those that have some like school resource officers, like I think you've all the, I thought my understanding was that they had one, but if there were multiple, um, you know, I'm, I just, I haven't seen the, the information come out on it. Um, you know, there are other ways to actually better defend those schools, right? There are ways to, um, you know, have armed teacher programs that allow for teachers to be able to train and, and be armed and defend their students. There are ways to, to make them not this weird kind of pseudo hybrid gun free zone. But, you know, Uvalde's another good example where I talk, Texas has an existing mental health law, right? And the, that person was deranged. I mean, it's, it's clear that there were prior visits from law enforcement that could have triggered the law enforcement to use these mental health laws. And those, that wasn't done. We shouldn't be looking to new systems that don't, that avoid due process and that are specifically designed to skip due process steps. I mean, that's all that red flag laws do, right? They're designed to skip that initial due process touch. Like we shouldn't be looking to those when there are things in place that aren't being used that aren't working. We don't need more laws that don't work because those will just get in the way and will just harm peaceable people. We need to, to look at why they didn't work in the first place and then figure go from there. Well, your Twitter handle, by the way, is hilarious. It's the Wizard of Laws with the Z. Um, and I heard Charlie Cook recently talk about this, the National Review writer. I think he was on Jonah Goldberg's podcast on The Remnant talking about this. And that passing more laws isn't the answer. There are a lot of laws that are not being accessed that are on the books that do respect due process, that in a lot of these cases are not being followed or, or tools aren't being used that already exist. It's just sort of let's create a moral panic to take people's guns, which in and of itself is just ludicrous. You can't you're not going to confiscate all the guns in America. It's just not going to happen without significant violence. Um, what are what are some examples of laws that are on the books that are not being enforced that that might make this better, that respect the Second Amendment and respect you know people's constitutional rights? Yeah, I mean, it, it's tough to kind of. Uh, go through. I mean, I think what people don't realize when when you talk about firearms in America is they just don't realize how heavily regulated they already are, um, and how many touch points there already are in order to in, in already in existence for peaceable people to own guns. There's this picture that's been created by media and by anti-gun advocates that guns are the wild west and it's um you know it's easier to what are the taglines right it's easier to drive a car than it is to to buy a gun or uh right the popular one of yeah my know, gun can get an abortion but i can't i think i saw that one recently yeah right gun you know <laughs> if only women weren't as regulated as guns are i mean it's it's insane when you think about it if you buy a firearm from a retailer in the united states you have to go through, you, you go through a background check that exists. You talked about this actually with a little bit with that, that Texas shooting, right? Here's an example who failed to, to put the information into the federal background check system, right? NICS, the national instant criminal background check system. Somebody messed up. Somebody didn't put his record there. Didn't upload it. What happened to that person? Was, was that resolved? Is that loop been closed? We have no idea because now we're just talking about other irrelevant laws that can be passed. So we need to look at, at that. Um, so you buy a gun from retail, you go through a background check, that firearm has been controlled and been monitored by the federal government from the day that it was manufactured until the day that it made it into your hands. There are strict manufacturer's requirements. There are strict tracking requirements. Every, every licensed individual that that gun passes through has to record that it passes through them. That serial number on the firearm is recorded at that point of sale on a document with your name on it um, for posterity's sake. Those are kept for used to be at least 20 years after a, a, a business closed even, but now they're kept in perpetuity. So, and then beyond that, right? States have storage requirements. States have laws about what you can or can't buy. A lot of those are unconstitutional and are hugely problematic, but this isn't some some wild west that it's painted to be. Guns are heavily regulated in the United States. In fact, 
they're so heavily regulated that people who could be buying fire that should be able to be buying firearms to protect their lives that should be able to have access don't. And the problem isn't that, um, you know, that we need to pass more laws to disarm more people. It's the exact opposite. We need to get rid of laws that are disarming people. We need to be empowering peaceable people. And we need to ensure that people have access to the tools that they have a constitutionally protected right to have access to. Is there any truth to the, you know, one of these other common slogans is that, you know, you look at the the rise of gun violence since the, the Bush administration lifted bans on certain types of guns and uh, more guns just create more violence. Uh, is that true, Cody? No, no. When you and and this is the problem that you start getting into when you get into a lot of these data points, right? Is it all depends on how you filter it out, right? Yeah. By the way, that was uh, produced by every town. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Which is the Michael Bloomberg gun violence uh, the, for abolition, basically. Yeah. Right. The to to ban handguns was their initial goal. Um, no. So as soon as you start applying filters and stuff, people are bending data to, to say whatever it needs to say, or sorry, rather whatever they want it to say. So, I mean, when you look at the old so-called assault weapons ban, really what it was is it was a ban on certain features, right? The sales didn't necessarily alter. People just started, stopped putting certain things on, on AR platformed rifles so that they didn't meet the ban and they can still be sold and still be purchased. I, I mean, I think there's some, some clear things. When you look at the actual like gun, like crimes that are committed with guns and, and deaths that are committed with guns versus the amount of firearms in the United States, you begin to understand what it really looks like, right? The vast majority of deaths by firearm are suicides. It's a problem that we don't talk about. It's a problem that gun control seemingly doesn't, the gun control movement seemingly doesn't want to talk about because it would change the numbers in this country dramatically. But if we need to be talking about something to drop you know, deaths by gun, it, it's suicide. That's what we should be talking about. That is a huge, huge um, contributor to the to the number of deaths in this country so, when so, it comes to firearms. So why do you think mass shootings, is, is it just a, a matter of, I mean, it's just morally outrageous when several people die in a club, like just happened in, what was it, California? Or, I mean, Duvalde is just a tragedy that I think every normal like person had a strong gut reaction and a depression for two days after that. Right. Like, is it, have we just sort of desensitized the individual dying because we're so used to, to kind of being inundated with multiple people dying? I guess I don't understand my own question. I guess I should clarify it a little bit, but you know, why, why do we talk so much about mass shootings and not enough about the one, you know, suicide deaths, which is just a real, real tragedy. Yeah, and that that club shooting was in Colorado Springs, in Colorado. Um, and and by real, real tragedy, I don't mean to minimize the other. Tra I'm just saying, you know, it's they're, they're both tragedies. <laughs> yeah, cl clarify that. Absolutely. You know, I think as terrible as it is, um, media gloms on to these these big public shootings, right? And they are horrendous. They are horrible. You know, we need to empower people to be able to protect themselves in these places so that they can respond like in the mall, right? Like that, that is what we need to do to address those. The reason why I think is, is media just, just jumps onto those. If you look at, you know, gun deaths, like deaths by firearm in a lot of inner cities across the United States, right? Like if you amalgamate the shootings in Chicago versus when you look at anything else, there are more mass shootings in Chicago under their the general definition than there are anywhere else. We're not talking about the places where, you know, actual, like we actually need to have a conversation. Um, instead, the gun control movement grabs these big events because it does pull at people's heartstrings so that they can tell this narrative and that they can try and leave people defenseless. I find it absolutely disgusting and revolting when the, the very people that are responsible for disarming people go to these places and stand in front of podiums after these horrific events and use them to advocate for more public disarmament. They use them to advocate to leave more people defenseless. And it's a grandstanding political stunt. Um, if 
we want to protect people, we need to empower people and we need to empower communities and we need to allow them to arm themselves. We don't need to stop them from possessing arms because that doesn't solve the problem. All right. So let's go back to the original, uh, the original point that we were talking about the sales code in uh, the banks. What's the future? How does it look for that? I know that uh, Tom Cotton, one of my top three least favorite senators, at least stood up on this. Um, he he seemed like he wanted to kill it. Where's the what's the future for the bank code for gun sales? Yeah. So circling and on, I, you know, I get a little intense when it comes to that stuff. I, <laughs> I think it's really important. But when you cir circle back to this gun code, um, here's where I'm concerned that it's going. And here's where I think that people should if people have the opportunity to um, to push back is what we have to avoid is that that two pronged approach of the people that advocated for this code first that they're going to claim that the data says something it doesn't right so people broadly understanding what this code actually does is just really important writ large second preventing that bridge from being drawn between government and these these private entities that are classifying these purchases right so i'm not saying that government should pass a law that prohibits them from coding that's not appropriate but what government can do is restrain itself, right? Government can put in its own place laws that prohibit it from buying this data or using this data to initiate investigations, which it shouldn't be used for because it doesn't give any real information. You can look to places like, you know, Missouri passed the Second Amendment Preservation Act, which I've written on before and has its own, you know, interesting moments and, and great moments. But there's nothing that stops a state from prohibiting its own law enforcement from buying this, these, this data, using this data in investigations, or using it as the basis to conduct any sort of, uh, you know, individual visits with peaceable people who bought items at a gun store. I mean, that's where we can really draw the line here. All right. Cody was new with new ski. All right. Uh, Please, shameless self-promotion time. Where can people follow if you they want to learn more about your work? Yeah, absolutely. So, uh, you know, at Firearms Policy Coalition, they can follow us at firearm or they could visit us at firearmspolicy.org. You can follow us on social medias uh, at gun policy on just about everything. For me, as you mentioned, I am the wizard of laws with a Z on just about every social platform. So go ahead and give us a follow and uh, check out our work and see what we're doing. All right. Thank you so much for joining me, Cody. It was great to have you here. And thank you, listener, for joining us. We really appreciate your time. If you learned something, please share this with your friends. That is how you help content creators that you love grow. And we really do appreciate you joining us here on The Chris Spangle Show.